life has put us in situations, not just randomly. You're in a situation to learn something about yourself. And if you are miserable, if the moment you quit it or run away from it, guess what's going to happen? In your next job, the same thing will come. Or the same situation will arise in a different environment where you will have to overcome it. Because that's how life works. Life will constantly keep putting things in your face that you don't like till you say, I am free from it. Hello and welcome to episode three of the Show Up podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'm stoked you're here because this episode was an absolute gem. This was recorded a few days ago after our first ever pop-up show up on a Saturday here in Barcelona, where Swami Shidananda shared some teachings on the beach, led a guided meditation session and finished up with an Om chant of more than 150 people. It was a special day to say the least. Swami is an incredible communicator and spiritual educator. That combination makes for a truly special podcast where he can dissect seemingly larger than live topics such as love, duty, purpose, self-acceptance, and more, with supreme elegance and simplicity, making it easy to digest and understandable for anyone. We held an exclusive Q&A at the end as well, where our Patreons could submit personal questions to him. You can join the Patreon for exclusive guest Q&A submissions, discounts on events, merch and workshops, early notice and bookings for our retreats, and daily mindfulness live streams such as journaling, guided meditation, yoga, and breath work. To check it out, go to patreon.com forward slash show up global. Again, a big thank you to Swami for this incredible museum type day and enjoy this one. It truly is a treat and Swami gets straight into it. Enjoy. So in the ashram, what we see is that the women, the women start to tend more towards the masculine energy and men start to turn more towards the feminine energy. And then at the end, there's a balance. So if you look at a lot of the monks, my, me, as an example, I was so much more masculine before I went to the ashram. And now I, I feel myself being more feminine, which is really, really interesting. And then so many of the women that came, they say the exact opposite. They say we feel so much more masculine now since, the, since we've been in the, in the ashram. Mm. And the nice thing about that and then the reason for that is it's very simple. What's the goal of spirituality? It's to realize who you are. Right? And what you are is eternal. It's the Atma. The Atma has no gender. It has no identity. It's just pure light. It's just pure love. So the more you go into spirituality, the more you notice that all of these different things, you start to transcend. The enlightened beings, when you look at them, you, you, even if they're masculine in nature, you'll never be able to tell that they're masculine. They're so neutral. It's really, really uh, interesting. And how do you feel about being more feminine as a, as a man? Um, for me, it's, it's ironic. I, I always... Um, you know, for those sort of you that are listening that are maybe like, I'm single, I want to start dating somebody. I always joke around, if you want to find somebody, become a brahmachari. <laughs> if you want to find somebody, to take the vow of lifelong celibacy. Because the moment you do it, everybody starts coming towards you. Yeah. Because what are we attracted to? They're attracted to humans. We're attracted to that love inside of people. The outside thing is just a shell. This comes and goes. But that love inside, that's what's truly attractive. And so for me, I find that before, well, before I became a monk, the idea of being feminine or the idea of maybe not having huge muscles, because look at me, I'm, I'm extremely skinny. Uh, that was like, oh my gosh. But now I'm completely happy with myself. Of course, I, I, I run, I do things to make sure that I, you know, that I maintain my body. But there isn't this feeling that I have to be in a certain way. And that freeness allows me to have relationships in a much more meaningful way than I've ever had before. 
Of course, that doesn't mean I'm still a monk, so I can't go around dating people. <laughs> but I found that the relationships are much different. What I noticed this morning, because we, we began the, the day this morning with our typical show up session, but we, we did it on a Saturday morning. It was a little different. And what I noticed is that when you were walking along the beach, just behind you, I could see, well, f- walking with you, there was like eight women and they were all like, very, you know, listening very intently to what you're saying. And it just sort of popped into my, into my mind that, wow, this is like a, a very gravitational energy. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But, and then I thought perhaps, is it the, is it the, the, just the energy that you have that, that, that people in general are attracted to? Or is it this kind of sense of the feminine energy is attracted to, to the masculine energy that they can't have? Because you're mm. off the table, flicked into my mind. Definitely, also some part of it, right? We always want things that we can't have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not, because one of those women was my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> well, they say in spirituality, the things that you try to run towards, it runs away from you, and the things that you don't care about, it comes, and that's the that's the secret. When you really want something. And there's this ego base, like, I need to have it. As you start to approach it, no matter how hard you try, it will run away. But the moment you're like, it doesn't matter if I have it or not, you'll see that everything chases after you. Even with money, you know, for example, before I was in investment banking and I was so focused on I need to make money, I need to do this, I need to do that. Now I don't care about money. And so many people, without even me asking, want to donate money, want to give money. They ask me, when are you starting your ashram? When are you building something? How can we give money? And I'm like, I don't want your money. <laughs> I don't have any use for it right now. Like you can keep it. Maybe in the future we can use it in a better way. But people are, it's almost counterintuitive. They're literally begging me to take their money. And so when you start to see life that, in that way, when you become free, Everything that you need to serve and to do your dharma will, gi- will be given to you. But as long as we're in the ego, then no matter how hard we try, we're never going to be able to accomplish the things that we want in life. Whether that's something material like a job or whether that's a life partner or whatever it might be. Because even with a life partner, the moment you start becoming attached to them, in the sense that you start feeling insecure, you start looking at their text to see where they're going. You know, what, what are you doing? Why were you, why didn't you answer my call? Where were you last night? The moment you start to go into those things, it's like a free fall. And all the things that you're afraid of will start to manifest in your reality. And so in that way, when you are s- centered in yourself, when you're confident in yourself, when you do the right things in the relationship, then have trust and faith that it's going to work out in the right way. And if it doesn't, then it's for the better. But the moment you start becoming insecure, all of your worst fears will start to manifest. It's kind of like the law of attraction. Isn't exactly, it? Yeah. exactly. But in regards to this, um, the, the women thing, this is a little bit different. Uh, there's two takes to it. One could be that. One could be the idea that... Um, we gravitate towards things that we can't have. But there's another really beautiful story where there was, um, uh, there was a great saint, uh, a great teacher, and he had a son. And the teacher was around 60, 70 years old, and the son was um, in his 20s. Very, very good looking, very, very attractive. So one day they were both walking, and the, the father and the son, uh, they, were, they were in the woods, and the son went a bit ahead. And they came across this pool where there were uh, 10 naked women, just showering, dancing, having fun in the lake. And the boy, who is 25, 26, walks by, and they all just continue. They don't look at him. They don't try and cover themselves. They don't say, oh, what are you doing? They just continue playing. And then the, the older gentleman comes, and then as soon as he comes, they all cover themselves. And they're like, oh my gosh, what is he doing here? Why is he here? And so the man, he's like, he goes to the women. He's like, I don't understand. My son is your age. 
He's so good looking. When he comes, you are fine. But me, I'm an old man. I'm 70. Why are you acting like that towards me? And the woman said, your son, we don't perceive any lust in him. We don't perceive that he wants to, uh, to have sex with us or to be with us. We've perceived that he's free. And so therefore, we're also free. But with you, we perceive there's still a part of you that has that lust. And because of that, we cover ourselves. And so in that way, the reason why I feel that I'm comfortable talking to women, men, whatever, is that for many, many years, we work on letting go of that lust. We work on letting go of that, that addiction to, uh, to be with somebody, to have that type of sexual experience. And when that starts to go away, we can become more free with each other. But as long as that's still there, it makes things uncomfortable, especially when you're very uh, in the feeling, when you're very intuitive. Because women are much more intuitive than men. They feel much more than men. So they can feel your energy and they can either be attracted to it or repulsed by it. You see, the thing with, um, with spirituality is that there's a, a positive and a negative between, let's say, men and women for now. Women are much more intuitive, but they are much more also emotional. So when they start going on the spiritual path, sometimes they confuse their intuition with their emotion, and that takes them away because they start becoming too emotional about the situation. Men on the other side, we're much more intellectual. So it's much harder for us to feel. But once we start to feel, it's easier for us to go deeper on the path. So there's a positive and a negative to both aspects. Hmm. What an interesting analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know we were going to go there. But no, I'm no, no, no. <laughs> this is the best intro ever for the podcast. Gliding straight into it. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you worked in investment banking. And now you're sat between us with the orange robes and the... The tilak. The tilak, is that what yes. it's uh, the corporate yeah. face paint? Mm -hmm. um, how did you get from A to... To Z. To Z. <laughs> <laughs> to A squared. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think um, it's, it's a very long story. And of course, if people want to hear it, they can, they can find out more um, to other avenues. But in the very, let's say, um, quick overview, I grew, I grew up in the United States, but I was born in India. And so as I was growing up in the States, I was very much materially minded, meaning that I was very much focused on making as much money as possible, having all the nice things in life, having a relationship and so forth and so on. And that was my drive. And I really had no sort of inclination towards spirituality whatsoever. And I did become very successful. I ended up working in finance. I ended up working in investment banking. At a very young age, I was making more money than 99% of the people in the world. And I had the Mercedes. I had the nice, um, I guess, suit. I had the, the, the golf, the golfing every day, making deals. And... At this point, I had um, a feeling that I have to get married. At this time, I was dating um, my girlfriend for about seven years. And so I had gone to Vegas. And of course, we have the saying, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> but then after I came back, I was like, okay, I have to get married. So I went, I bought a ring. And I went and I proposed to her. And in that moment, when I put the ring on her hand... I felt an incredible sense of loneliness because a lot of times as individuals, especially in the Western world, we are working towards a goal which we believe will give us happiness because we're very much goal-oriented. In the East, it's not goal-oriented. We try and just live in the present moment and we try and find happiness in what we have. In the West, we're taught after I go get my university degree, after I reach this milestone, after I reach this milestone, I'll be happy. So we're always goal-oriented. 
So in the same way, I thought if I get married, I will then unlock the next level of happiness. It's like a video game. You go from level to level, and then every level you unlock another amount of happiness. So I thought if I get married, I'll unlock the next level of happiness. But actually, I felt the exact opposite. I proposed to her. And in the moment that I put the ring on her finger, I felt an incredible sense of loneliness. And I could not explain why I was feeling like that. And I'm, a, I'm Indian, she's Italian, so the wedding was going to be quite big. And as the wedding started to get closer and closer, the feelings started to get stronger and stronger. And eventually we went to go have some tea together. And as, she, as she, we were sitting down and having tea, I was like, should I tell her? Should I tell her how I feel? Because <clears throat> masculine energy, we try and suppress things, right? We try and suppress our intuition. Because actually, men are also very, very intuitive. But we, try, we don't express it. We try to suppress it and say, no, 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 just forget it. And I was the same way. So even though I was feeling like this, there was no way I was going to tell her how I was feeling. And somehow I think the divine knew this and they're like, okay, we got to make it work in a certain way. And she looked at me while we were having tea and she said, I have to tell you something right now. If you stay with me, we will have children. We will have a home. We will have a nice life, but you will never be happy with me. You have to go. You're meant to do something great in this world. You're not meant to stay here with me. You have to leave now. And it was such a powerful statement. She was not spiritual, right? She was not spiritual at all, but somehow something spoke through her. And in that moment, we knew, okay, we needed to take a break. And that was one of the hardest moments of my life because she loved me and I loved her. But we both knew that we couldn't be together. And it was really difficult. And in that moment, of course, when we don't have purpose in our life, when we don't have something that anchors us, what do we do? We turn to material gratification. And I started to drink every day. I started to do drugs every day. I would be waking up. I would be blacked out, waking up, going to work, counting down the moment till I could go to the bar again. And I lived like this for a very long time. And in that moment, my cousin came and visited me and he saw how I was living my life. And he said, you have to change. If you don't change, it's not going to be good for you. So I said, okay, what do I do? And he gave me a book called The Autobiography of the Yogi. And that book, I read it, it changed my entire life. It was about a story of a, a saint that came from India to America and started teaching something called Kriya Yoga. And so that book, what it had an effect on me was that even though I might not have believed in all of these things, it changed something in me where I literally could not drink anymore. People would give me tequila and I would look at it and I'd say, this is disgusting. I would still take the shot, <laughs> <laughs> social pressure, but I was like, I don't want to do this. And... I would be with people, I would watch porn. Porn was a big thing because after reading this book, I could not watch porn. It was so weird. Like I would put it on and I would say, this is absolutely disgusting. Why am I watching this? I literally could not watch it anymore. And in the same way, I, could, I had to stop eating a lot of meat and things were changing in me and I could not understand what was going on. And I knew that if I did not leave, this feeling would die down and I would go back to my normal life. And it was, a, it was a turning point in my life because no matter who you are, every single soul, my guru told me this, has an opportunity, is given an opportunity to change. But 99% of us, when we, give, when we have received that opportunity, we do not take advantage of it. But to take advantage of it, you have to be a gambler. So I think this kind of like 
ties into <laughs> something that we all have, which is a gut feeling, right? Exactly. You felt that you needed to change or that it would die down and you would continue down, exactly. you know, the same old path that you were on. When it comes to gut feeling, when do you feel like you should trust it or question it maybe that you're confusing it or it's conflicted with something else, maybe lust or how how would you yeah differentiate it from uh from things that are similar but might feel the same you can't that's why <laughs> sorry that's why when you're on the spiritual path it's said that you cannot be a business person you have to be a gambler because a business person makes a deal and expects something in return a gambler puts all of their chips in without knowing the outcome and with possibility possibly losing. So when you take these decisions in life, I'm not going to say that it's always going to work out because it could be the mind. You could lose. You could be burned. But if you have that sincerity that I want to change, then if you take that gamble, most of the time it will work out for you. But that intention has to be there that I want to change. Because if you don't have that intention, if you don't have that true intention, then it won't work out. But if you're like, I want to change. I want to be different. I want to experience something different than what I've been experiencing. And you put your chips in the middle. Most of the time, it will work out for you. So in that moment, I knew I wanted to change. But if I stayed there any longer, that feeling would be gone. And I would go back to life and how it was like before. So in that moment, I said, I have to go. So I booked a ticket like the very next day. And I was planning to go to Germany, Italy, Spain, and to India. And I remember the last night I was with my friends. And I told them, by the way, I'm leaving. And they all started laughing at me. Like, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? I said, I'm just going to go. I'll be gone for a few weeks. And that night, I, had, I ate meat, I got drunk, and I was with somebody. And that was the last time that I did any of those things in my life. It was almost like the divine was saying, I'm going to give you this one more time to enjoy. <laughs> and then after that, you'll never experience it again. Make the most of it. And so the next day, I, 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 I was on a plane. I arrived in India. And... When I was in India, I had the grace and the fortune to meet an enlightened master, somebody who was an embodiment of love. And in their presence, for the first time, I felt something deeper than I've ever experienced before. And I knew that that is what I want to experience all the time. So I said to him, I want to learn from you. I want to learn how to love. And he looked at me and he says, your family wants you to be a millionaire, but I will make you a millionaire of the heart. And for 10 years, I lived with him. I never, I never saw my family. I never saw my friends. And I just stayed with him for 10 years, learning. And then after 10 years, he said, now go and teach. And so that's a very short Reader's Digest version. Of course, if the, 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 the listeners want to hear more, they can uh, they can hear in the the path of a Swami podcast. It's a really great podcast. Yeah, it's a really and good one. You've done such a good job of te- of telling your story and making it engaging, but also it's quite concise too. Like they're short episodes; they're like little bite sized pieces of wisdom, but also like this really engaging story that you have. And the one thing that I or like immediately when I met you, I thought Swami, he's kind of the embodiment of this novel. And you've heard it before, <laughs> the, uh, the monk who sold his Ferrari. Mm, mm. And for anyone that's not aware, I mean, that is a novel. It's not a true story, but there's a lot of common commonalities between that story by Robin, Robin Sharma and your, and your actual life. Yes, it's actually, I'm so grateful that I lived the life that I did before I became a monk because it allows me to connect with people in a more relatable way. If I was a monk my whole life, if I lived somewhere in India, 
I never experienced any of the things. It's very hard to relate to people. But for me, I want people to, to maybe hear me or listen or feel inspired, not to become a monk, but to say, well, if he can do it, I can do it also. If he can change, I can also change. And that's really the most important thing for me. So what are the, what are the other options? Because for me, I do have a... I do feel a bit of a calling to this life, right? But seeing myself uh, as a monk and, uh, and, you know, leaving my family and everything, that's just, it doesn't, it doesn't feel right for me personally. So what are, what, are, what are the options for someone who feels like that? So the goal of spirituality is to love. To reach that goal, you have two paths. You have the path of the monk and you have the path of the household. The path of the monk is somebody that renounces everything of the world, tries to go within, and starts to experience love by giving up their material desire. The path of the householder is one that lives in the world, that does their job, gets married, but practices inner detachment. So for those, I always tell people that come to me that want to become monks, I said, no. Don't become a monk. That's not your path. And for those that are householders, sometimes I look at them and say, actually, you're meant to be a monk. And destiny will always bring you to the path that you're meant to live. But that path, if you embrace it fully, will take you to love. There was once, so maybe some of the listeners have heard of something called the Bhagavad Gita, which is a, a Vedic scripture where essentially there's a warrior. He's a householder and he is conflicted about his duty and he wants to run away and become a monk. But Krishna, who was an embodiment of love, says to him, no, your path is not to be a monk. Your path is to be a householder, but do it without attachment. And there was once um, a disciple of a guru and he went to his teacher and said, why was this Gita given on a battlefield? Why was Arjuna a warrior and Krishna uh, a charioteer and, and it happened in the middle of a battlefield? Why didn't it happen in, a, in an ashram or a monastery? Yeah, isn't this all about peace and love? That was my, my yeah. reservation about the, the Gita. Yeah. And so the, the disciple says to him, or the guru says to him, look, you can go into a cave and you can meditate. You can meditate for 20 years. And in the cave, there's nobody to bother you. There's no pizza to, to attract you, no attractive person to attract you and in that cave you might think you become a great person right that's given up all attachment but the moment you leave that cave and you step foot on a bus in india i don't know if some of you have been to india the bus holds 10 people but there's 50 people and they're pushing you shoving you calling you names it's chickens next to you yeah. <laughs> yeah then you know if you're truly a yogi or just another human being so the Gita was given on the battlefield because the battlefield represents life. Mm -hmm. And it's for those that choose to live in the world, but still aspire to love. So in Sanskrit, we call the term Tyaga. Tyaga means somebody who's inner detached. So inside of them, they're not attached. But outside, they do their duty. And that's how we should be. And I've met so many householders who are much more spiritually advanced than monks. Because in, inwardly, they're detached, but outwardly, they do their duty to the best of their ability. They give their 100%. Um, yes, yeah, so you just touched on duty, which another word for is dharma, I believe. And I was wondering if you had any uh, stories. Chase told me that you had one. <laughs> uh, about one of your teachers that told, told you a story about the importance of dharma and duty. Mm. I was very curious to hear if you could share it with us. Sure. I mean, there's many stories about dharma. You know, dharma is, as you said, the duty that you've been given. And a lot of times that duty could be to be a monk or that duty could be to be a husband or a, a father or a mother or a dentist or an accountant. And a lot of the times... We want to do great, great things. We want to accomplish great, great things. 
But actually, if you really want to change the world, all you have to do is look at yourself. There was a man, and he was um, he was on his deathbed, and as he was lying there, person came and he says, "Before you die, did you ever regret anything?" And the man was laying in bed and he was reflecting and he said, "You know, when I was younger, I wanted to change the world." And I tried and I tried and I tried. And no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't change the world. So I said, you know what? Let me change my country. So I tried to change my country. Couldn't change that. Then I said, you know what? Let me change my, my city. Tried. Couldn't do it. Then I said, let me change my friends. Tried. No shot. And I said, let me change my wife. Definitely no shot. <laughs> I said, let me change my children. Also not happening. And as I'm lying there in bed, I started to realize, you know what? If I just changed myself, that would have automatically changed my children. My children would have automatically changed my wife. My wife would have changed the city. The city would have changed the, the country. The country would have changed the world. And so if you really want to make a difference in this world, learn and start by changing yourself, by transforming yourself by learning how to love. And if you do that, you make a great impact because you know, there's, a, there's a quote that says, human beings um, completely overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. And so a lot of times people get very, very excited about the spiritual path. They're like, okay, I wanna change the world. But then after one year, they just die off. But those that are consistent, they do their practices, do the things they need to do every day. Over time, they are the ones that really make a difference. And when you are more aligned with your dharma, the easier life flows? Yeah, because the more you're aligned with your dharma, the more you're able to spread love. And the more you share love, the more that love comes back to you. You see, whatever you give to the world, you receive back. You give love, guess what will happen? Love will come back to you. For me, I live such an amazing life. And people ask me, how do you live such a nice life? I say, because I try my best to share love. And that, because of that, very, there's, a, there's a quote. It says, Dharma protects those who protect it. So if you do the Dharma of sharing love, Life will always take care of you. You will always have what you need. But if you give negativity, guess what's going to come back? Negativity. And then if, because a lot of people like have been hurt, have been abandoned, have been through trauma, and they might find it very difficult to love and trust and to get back on that path. How, how would you advise people that find themselves in those shoes to try to, try to get back on, on the rails? The people that have changed this world the most are the people that have gone through the most terrible suffering. There's only two ways to grow on the spiritual path, suffering or grace. And a lot of times, because we don't take advantage of the grace, suffering comes to help us to see things differently. And many people, they don't understand that Suffering is actually their strength. When they've gone through very trying and troubling times, if they're able to embrace it and see how that reality, if used and shared with others, can help others, that becomes the source of their greatest strength. And so in that way, when people are struggling, it's not easy. But if they're able to embrace it, and if they're able to use that, to then share their experiences with others, to help others, you will see that their life becomes so beautiful. But it's just the shift, right? You have to make that shift. And for many, that's very difficult to make the shift. And this is why I always talk about grace. And this is why I travel. You know, for me, if you were to ask me what you enjoy the most, I would say, Yes, I like to travel and share. But actually, most of the time, I like being by myself. 
I like to be in. If I had the choice, I'd be in a cave in the Himalayan mountains right now. <laughs> but stuck in here with us. <laughs> but the reason why I travel and I share is because I hope somebody who's going through some struggle hears this and says, "You know what? I want to take that struggle and I want to transform it and I want to share it and I want to help others by." by relating to them through the experiences that I've had. And so that's why we do the things that we do. That's why we share and talk about these things, to maybe inspire somebody who's listening to reflect and see how they can um, approach their struggles in a different way. So something that we did this morning that we do at Show Up every week is as part of our, it's basically a physical practice. So from the Vedic perspective or from just even your perspective, what are the practical things that a person could do to improve their life within a very short period of time? So a lot of, so I'll introduce a word called samskara. Samskara are patterns that we have cultivated in this life and in many lives prior. These patterns are patterns of anger, lust, inconsistency, lack of self-worth, lack of self-discipline. These are qualities that we have cultivated. And the more we go into it, the more deeper they get ingrained in us. So these samskaras, these patterns, stop us from loving. So when we do physical exercises, when we go for swims, when we do these things, what happens is that it allows us to perceive the things that we need to overcome. It allows us to become silent and rise beyond these samskaras. So we have some clarity. But what do you see after the swim, after a few days, after a few hours, what happens? It all starts coming back again. It's the same with a therapist. You go to a therapist, they help you. And then after some time, you go back to the therapist again and again and again. So all of these physical practices, they help you to find clarity, but they don't help you to actually transform the samskara. The samskara, you can look at it as a vibration. And so the way to take a vibration and to transform it is that you have to Transform it with the vibration of love. So you need a practice that is resonating with love. And a very simple practice that you can do is mantras. Mantras are, or everything's love, right? This is love. We're in, at the end of the day, everything is only love. But because of our mind, we don't perceive it. So imagine you want to go from channel one to channel two. What do you need? A remote. Yeah, switch. You can't just sit there and say, I'm going to will the TV to turn to channel two. Unless you have a lot of strength, it's not going to happen. You need a remote. So the mantra is a remote. The mantra is a sensory manifestation that helps us when we chant it, when we think about it, when we reflect on it, it is purifying our mind and our samskara so we can love more. So a very, very simple practice is chanting a mantra that has a vibration of love. And that's what I always teach people is to chant a Vedic mantra. Because these mantras, it's not like, it's not John in his basement saying, you know what? This is a nice vibration. I'm going to start teaching it. These mantras are thousands of years old and they've withstood the test of time and they have been practiced and we see the result. It's like, imagine um, if you see a smoke. When you see the smoke, you say, oh, that smoke means there's fire, right? So uh, a certain visual representation makes you understand that there is a fire without necessarily seeing the fire for yourself. So in the same way, when you look at people and you see how much they've transformed because of the mantra, it makes you believe, okay, this mantra can also help me. And as you start to perform it, you will see that transformation happen. So that's 
for me, a very simple way is just to connect to a mantra which you resonate with, which has a frequency of love. Hmm. I love that you use the word frequency because just before we met, I'd had uh, a couple of weeks of learning all about sound and the healing power of sound because sound or at least vibration is everything. Like this is everything is vibrating. Everything is right? vibration. So I would, I'm not a quantum physicist and I would love to ask uh, a true scientist uh, this question. How can uh, the sound of the mantra or the sound of OM how does that change us by by free, by resonating within our body? And I feel so much of that happens through through these vocal cords, and that it's deeply in my chest when I when I speak. And I've been doing this for like a month, like every single day. I've been doing this for a month, and I feel so grounded, and and I can feel it in my voice. And so it's like this interesting question of how how does your vocal tone how do how do you actually sound? And how does that uh, relate to how you're feeling in yeah, terms of yeah. being? I'd be interested you. to know the science behind it. But from a Vedic perspective, it's all about frequency and vibration. Because this material world has a certain vibration and love has a certain vibration. And when we connect to that love, we start to see what is beyond just the physical aspect. Hmm. Because I don't want to go so much into philosophy, but it's called Maya. Maya is an illusionary energy that has made us forget that at the end of the day, we're all connected. So it's just an, it's just an illusion. For some reason, we have forgotten that in reality, we're all connected. The, the, ter- the symbology that we give is a pearl necklace. So if you look at a pearl necklace, you see the pearls, right? So if I had no idea, if I was an alien and I came and I saw the pearls and I only saw the pearls, I would say, okay, so each necklace is individually connected. But what is the underlying element? It's the thread. Cut the thread, what happens to the necklace? It ceases to exist. So in that way, we are all unique, but there is an underlying thread that is holding everything together. I noticed this morning when we were sitting down having a, uh, having a coffee or a tea after show up, there was a lot of people like really like waiting to ask you these questions. What, is the, what are the questions that you want to be asked? Actually, any question that helps people to reflect. Because for me, I love talking about spirituality. I love talking about spirituality. That's the only thing that my life is. My life is just to be in service of others, to speak about love. And when we're not, we can have conversations that have nothing to do with God or the divine. But as long as it's based on transforming, understanding, reflecting, I'm happy to have that conversation. But the moment we start talking about things that don't matter, then for me, I say to myself, okay, you too enjoy, you know, because it's something of the world. Send me a message when you want to talk about something else. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Of course, it's important sometimes to talk about politics or Netflix or whatever else. No problem. But for me, my focus is always on love. And that's what my, my teacher told me when I was leaving uh, the ashram after spending 10 years with him. Um, I was coming to New York and, and I had no money. Because he had told me, I'm not going to make you a millionaire, but I will make you a millionaire of the heart. And I looked at him and I said, Guruji, what am I going to do? Like, I have no money. I have no place to go. I have nowhere to stay. Like, I'm going to be homeless. And he looked and he smiled at me. Because I said, can you make it easy for me? <laughs> and I, can you make this easy? Can you organize something for me? And he smiled at me and he said, that's not how it works. <laughs> nope. <laughs> he, said, he, he said, because he has a very large ashram in Germany. And he said, you know how hard I had to work? How difficult it was to build this? It's not going to be any easier for you. But I promise you, if you stay focused... After two years, 
everything will work out. But for the next two years, it will be very difficult for you. But as long as you don't lose your focus of why you are in America, why you are going back, you will be fine. And so for me, I've always remembered that. And whenever the focus is on the divine or on love, everything's good. The moment I, I find my focus going somewhere else, then I, I, I back away from the situation or the conversation. And that focus has helped to actually build an amazing ashram in the United States and build a very large community. Do you still find now that that focus sometimes wavers a little bit? Or? Of course, of course. It's, it's always happening like that. That's why every single day I have to do my spiritual practice because that centers me once again and realigns me with my focus. Because when I'm traveling, when I'm doing things, it's very easy to be pulled away. And so that practice, going back to it daily, is what keeps the focus. I'd like to hear your opinion on, um, you know, you mentioned your spiritual practice and the mantra, chanting, and I've got friends that are religious as well, and it, it sounds... Like it's, you know, the same coin with two different sides. It's practicing self-devotion, which is something that you touched on very beautifully at the retreat that we did. But it can come in so many different forms. Sure. Love takes many forms. My name is Swami. But if somebody says, hey, friend or son or husband or this or that, I might respond to that, right? So even though your name is Chase, if I say, friend, you will turn towards me. If I say lover, not me, your, your <laughs> wife or your girlfriend, you'll turn towards that, right? So even though you have one name, you reply to many other names. So in the same way, there's only love, but love manifests in different forms because all, we're all very unique. There's a quote that says, the truth is one, but the wise speak of it in many different ways. Because for me, I might like chocolate ice cream, you might like strawberry ice cream. Somebody might not like ice cream at all. So why would I force you to like vanilla ice cream when you don't like it? You, you see? Uh, yeah, yeah. And so yeah, for yeah, me, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> if you don't like vanilla ice cream, no problem. Eat something else, right? Eat something that sustains you. And so if you found another way to feel and experience love, go for it. My only thing I always say is make sure that practice you feel has the vibration of love. That's the only thing. If you have that common denominator, everything's good. But if that vibration is something else, if it stems from anger or dogmaticism or conquering or power or influence, then that's not good. So that vibration has to be of love. You have to feel it. And if it is, go for it. Do it sincerely and you will attain what you need to. You will find peace in this life. So where does the Vedic tradition overlap with the Bhagavad Gita and the, the Hare Krishna tradition? Because to me, they seem very similar. There's some overlapping there. How, where do they interplay? And maybe very quick in a nutshell of like three sentences, what is each? <laughs> Deeper. The newbies. Sure, sure, sure. So you have something called Sanatana Dharma or what is referred to as Hinduism. Okay, so you've probably heard of the term Hinduism. The actual term for it is called Sanatana Dharma, which means the path towards the eternal truth. That way of life has a certain set of teachings called the Vedas, which are the framework and reference to everything that is practiced and taught in that particular way of life. Now within Hinduism or Sanatana Dharma, there are many, many, many different lineages. Just like in Christianity, you might have Catholicism, uh, Protestant, Orthodox, so forth. The same thing is in Hinduism, but times a thousand, because that way of life has been around for 10,000 years. So you can imagine how many different lineages and traditions there are. So within that broad array of teachings, one of those teachings is the Bhagavad Gita. It's one specific set of teachings that you can relate to, connect to, and say, I want to learn that. So it's like strawberry ice cream. But there's also chocolate, vanilla, pistachio, and all kinds of different things. And so the Bhagavad Gita is the most well-known. 
Now, that's a scripture or, or a teaching. Now, for example, the Hare Krishna movement or what is referred to as ISKCON, that's a lineage that focuses on saying that Krishna and the Gita is the best way towards um, learning who you are. So I'm not ISKCON or Hare Krishna. This is a very specific sect that um, teaches certain devotional practices. My, the tradition I belong to and that my guru comes from, we're more on the understanding that um, we don't say that there's one that is the highest. We say the Gita can help. Krishna is great, but if you want to try something else, go for it. If you want to do something else, go for it. So I find that we're much more, let's say, open and accepting of different traditions. So in that sense, is it really a religion? No, I never talk about Sanatana Dharma as a religion. I always talk about it as a way of life. And because a lot of times people want to, to make it a religion. And for me, it's always, no, anybody and everybody can practice this way of life. And you don't have to be religious. You don't even have to believe in God. All you have to have is a feeling of, I want to transform. I want to become fearless. I want to experience some love in my life. If you have those three things, this way you can do and it will help you. So let's say someone wanted to practically implement some of these new practices into their lives to, to seek that transformation and make it happen. What, what would they do? The best thing to do is if they resonate towards this way, and they want to learn a mantra, they look for a teacher. A teacher that they can connect to, that they feel intuitively that this person is somebody that can help me. And then they reach out to the teacher and ask for some guidance. And then the teacher will give a mantra and a practice that they can start to do. That's the easiest and best way. But like I said before, it's also a gamble because there are many people that wear orange, there are many people that call themselves spiritual, but they're in it for the money. They're in it for power and influence. And so sometimes you might get burned. And I've met many people that have gotten burned. But I always tell them, look, if you're sincere, get back up and keep searching and the right teacher will come into your life. The right practice will come into your life that will help you to really transform. But there is no perfect solution. It has to be a feeling. There has to be some elements of grace. There has to be elements of a bit of a gamble as well. And what would you say to that person who, who really feels deep within them that they need to go out on this journey on their own, that, that they really don't feel resonate resonation with uh, Any being taught by anyone? Mm. You know, they want to yeah. be the, t the teacher themselves. That's also fine. That's also fine. You can make Google your guru. Mm. <laughs> You can find some teachings in Google and apply it in your life and use that. And then if something awakens in you that you want to find a physical teacher, great. But if you already have some teachings through your own individual search and it's working for you, also fine, no problem. Of course, I'm biased. I always feel a, a physical teacher is always going to be more beneficial for you. It's like anything in life. If you want to learn to sing, to do Kung Fu, uh, to do something, you can Google how do I learn Kung Fu and try and apply it, or you can go to a Kung Fu master and they can teach you, right? So it's, um, it's up to you. But if you don't feel comfortable with a living teacher, then no problem. But one thing I do want to share is that a lot of times when you take a teacher, people will say, oh my gosh, you have to serve the teacher. You know, you become a servant. I don't want to be a servant. I don't want to be told what to do. But in reality, I try and remind them, actually, in the world, we're also servants. We're also bound to this world, right? We have a boss. We have to make money. Tomorrow, you can be hit by a bus. Tomorrow, you can have cancer. Tomorrow, you can have um, Alzheimer's finished. So you're also a servant to the world. And you're, you're serving or you're a servant to Instagram, you know, exactly. whatever your patterns exactly. and addictions exactly. are digitally exactly. as well or Perfectly even with put. 
alcohol, drugs, you name it. Like you're, yeah. you are the servant to that unless you have that power deep within you to – and I don't like to use the word discipline anymore – but this devotion to self where you're like, I, I love myself so much that I'm not going to do that. When you're at that place, it's like, wow. <laughs> and that's the thing, you know, the guru or the teacher, the misconception is we think that the guru is saying, like, you have to serve me. No, the, the real guru is saying, look, I'm going to help you to find your own inner guru. No real guru wants to be served. But they understand that in service, what happens is that we let go of the ego. We become humble. And that humility allows us to experience the love within us. And so the real guru wants you to be your own guru, wants you to experience love within you. And that's the, that's the point, right? The point is not always to serve an external guru. It's to start to see that love in that external element inside of you. And then you're free, right? So a little bit of service for a lifetime of freedom for me is, is worth yeah, it. That's pretty good exchange. And how does I, this, uh, sorry. No, I, um, I mean, if you want to stay on topic, we can. No. I wanted to, because you've spoken about a couple of your teachers already and very, you know, fondly with a big smile on your face. Do you have a favorite teaching or moment or memory that you have with? Uh, with my guru? Yes. Of. I've had so many moments with my teacher that have helped me to... to or maybe a favorite struggle that he put you through or that, mm. that sure. came up. I've shared this with Chase and I like sharing this story because it's, it's, it's a really funny one. Because one of the things when we start to go on the spiritual path and when we're in the ashram is to allow us to conquer anger. Because anger is a detriment to taking the right decisions in our life. Because I'm sure everybody listening, when they're angry, have taken a decision that they end up regretting. So anger is something that was actually one of the biggest challenges for me. And so one day I had the grace that um, with my teacher, I was allowed to eat with him lunch and dinner every day. And it would be me in a, in a couple of months and I would do this for about five years. And so every day I would eat with him lunch and dinner. So one day, he comes up to me and he says, you're not eating with me anymore. And he walks away. So in this moment, I tried to be spiritual and not get angry or frustrated. And I said, okay, Guruji, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I went to my room. So I was in my room and I was eating by myself for a few days. And then one day, one of the disciples, another uh, devotee, another um, student, comes knocking at my door and says, Guruji's calling you, Guruji's calling you for dinner. It's like, oh, great. So I get very excited. I run up to the bungalow, to the area where he's eating. And it was a, it was a dining room where he, at this point, time he had invited 30 people. So they're all in the dining room. They're all eating. And I walk through the, the door and everybody stops and stares at me. And in the middle of eating, Guruji puts down his plate. And he looks at me and he says, what are you doing here? And I said, oh, Guruji, I was told that you invited me here. He said, I didn't invite you here. I meant to call somebody else, not you. But you can stay if you want. And he continued to eat. So you stay or you go? Uh, just, oof, I would stay, I think. Why would you stay? I guess it would be less awkward than to walk <laughs> back out of the door. <laughs> you? I don't know the story, so I think I probably would have done what you did. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, in this moment, I said the greatest gift is to be able to teach or to eat with your teacher. And so for me, un rather than understanding that, my mind went to, he doesn't like me. He doesn't want me there. He embarrassed me in front of everybody. And so I got super angry and I left and I slammed the door. And as I slammed the door, I realized, oh, that was a mistake. I should not have done that. <laughs> There's going to be some repercussions to that. And so I went back and a few days went and then my guru called me and he said, let's go for a walk. And as we were going for a walk, he looks at me 
And he says, by the way, I tested you a few days ago and you failed miserably. <laughs> the goal of being a monk is firstly to be grateful and to be humble. You have so much pride and arrogance. You think that you're so great. You think things should be in a certain way. With this pride, how are you going to ever love? How are you ever going to teach people love when you yourself are filled with so much pride? And then I said, oh, I'm so sorry, Guruji. And he said, it's fine. I'm going to test you again. Let's see if you pass the next time. And then he walked away. Then many years later, he tested me again. And I think this time I passed. But the thing is also with the external guru, is they're like a hammer. They're a hammer to your ego. And it's very difficult in this day and age to really follow, follow a guru sincerely because we live in an age of cancel culture. That they'll say, oh, my guru was mean to me. He was tough with me. But in reality, this has been happening for thousands of years. And unfortunately, because our egos are so big, sometimes the teacher has to bring the hammer. And if they don't, we're not going to change. And so these things, to live with a real life guru is like being around a constant fire. And that fire is very intense and it burns everything. And it's not for the faint of heart. I want to know what the second test was. <laughs> uh, it's on the podcast. Right? Many different, There's many different tests, many different tests. With, you know, you mentioned service and, um, and following duty and there's there's a talk that you do in this monday about you know creating from a from a positive place yes yes from a healthy place and now with show up we have come to this point where you know it started as a free event but we also want to have the you know capabilities to grow and expand and scale and, and reach more people how how do you look at that seeming conflict of interests where you want to be selfless and, and provide and be of service but you also have to be selfish and ask or charge for money to actually be able to to finance the, yeah. the greater reach and you know and that's not something that i'm not unfamiliar with because i also have a responsibility as a swami to have an ashram and there's many monks that are living there novice monks that don't have money that don't have anything and as one of the swamis responsible we have to have donations so we can keep the lights on, the monks get fed, things are happening, right? So we also, even though we're, we're renunciates, there's also a responsibility for us because we live in this world to find that balance. And so for me, I'll share a very a nice story that kind of, I believe, ties in both elements. So when I came to New York City, um, I had no money. And there was a lady that I had met when I was in Germany who had said, you can come and stay with me for a few months and you can start to teach and do things and then, you know, we'll see how things go. So she sponsored me and I was there. And for many days and almost a month, I was like, how are we going to make any money? How am I going to be able to create an ashram how are we going to create a place? How, all, how is all of this going to happen? It's extremely overwhelming. So one day I was walking, and this was in the middle of New York City, Times Square. Right? And as I was walking, I was thinking about all of these things. There was a man that was walking um, opposite of me, and, we, and he was homeless. And we went and we crossed paths. So as we were crossing paths, I looked at him and I could feel an immediate connection. It was like almost like a, a magnetic pull. And I immediately stopped. He immediately stopped. And he looked at me and says, what's your name? I said, at this time, I was not a Swami. I was a Rishi. So I said, Rishi Chidananda. And he said, oh, that's nice. He says, can I walk with you? He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for anything. He said, can I walk with you? I said, okay. So we started walking and we just talked about life and this and that. He wanted to know a little bit about my path and I asked him about his and, and we spoke for maybe a few minutes. 
And at this point, there is something called Navaratri, which in the Vedic tradition is uh, a time of nine nights where we celebrate the feminine aspect of the divine. So it's called the Divine Mother. So for nine nights, we celebrate this. And on the final ninth night is the, the sort of like the climax. It's the big celebration. And so this was the first time that I did not celebrate this nine nights at the ashram. And so I was feeling a bit sad that I was in New York City. Nobody was there. And this was the eighth night. And so we spoke very quickly. And then he said, I have to go. And he left. And as I said, there's millions of people in New York City. And the next day, I was in Brooklyn. So miles away in an underground train station, there's thousands of train stations and I'm sitting there waiting for the train. And then all of a sudden I hear to my right, hello, Rishi. And it was the same man, the same homeless man that I had met in Times Square the exact day before. And in New York, you never see somebody twice. But the very next day, he was sitting next to me, say, hello, Rishi. And I looked and I was freaked out. I said, how did you find me? How did you know I was here? And he smiled and he pointed. So this is called the Tilak. And the red line represents the Divine Mother. So he was Western. And he had no idea, I would presume, about what this means or represents. And I never spoke about it with him. But he points to the red line. And he said, the Divine Mother connected us again. He had no, I have no idea how he knew that this red line represents the Divine Mother. He says, the Divine Mother connected us again. And he's smiling. He says, can I ride with you? And I said, okay. So we get on the subway station and we start r riding. And he says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm trying to share love. And he said, if you're going to share love, you always have to act from a space of truth. This is a homeless man, okay? He has like a bunch of... <laughs> this he is looks, a movie scene. He looks completely <laughs> disheveled with, like, uh, with some peanut butter, some, sand, some, some bread, just random things. And then he says, what are you teaching the people? And I said, I'm teaching them the mantra, Om Namo Narayanaya. And in that moment, he has a big smile. And in the subway station, he starts chanting, Om Namo Narayanaya, Om Namo Narayanaya. He starts walking back and forth, chanting, Om Namo Narayanaya. And then he looks at me, he says, can I please give you some food? And I'm like, you know, you're homeless and you're offering me food. And I said, no, no, it's okay. You keep it. And he's like, okay. The train stopped, he came, he gave me a big hug and he said, may the Divine Mother and all of her children bless you. And this was the final night of Navaratri. He let go, he left and I never saw him again. And that was, in that moment, I had a clear sign that I have to help the homeless people. So the very next day, I had no money. I went to the place I was staying I made chai myself, chai tea. I cooked some food myself and I went out and I started feeding the people. And as I started feeding the homeless people, I started to have clarity about certain things. I started to meet people. Others wanted to help. So people started to help me to feed the homeless. We started to create a community. And through that community, I came across many connections and those connections helped me to raise enough money to then start creating a community, to then start creating um, an ashram, if you will. And so all of the money and the donations came when I started to serve and when I started to love without any type of attachment. So in that way, if you, are, if you believe what you are doing is helping people, then I promise you, you will start to find ways to help you to monetize so you can provide more things. But you have to trust in that process. It's not that you, you have to be stupid, right? As things started happening, I needed to, 
to 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 work to connect with people to start giving talks to raise funds so i had to do the work but it all stemmed from the single act of i want to do something where i want to share love so if that sincerity is there then all the other things will fall into place so every day you have to check your sincerity and if you do that you will have so many opportunities to make money that you won't even know what to do with yeah the intent is so important and one of the things you told me earlier on or maybe it was just from the yoga teaching was the intention behind the yes. mantra is is everything you yes. can't just sit yes. there and yes. say these things over and over and be thinking about work or exactly. be thinking about so in keeping that in mind do you have any tips for people who want to build focus <laughs> yes so if you want to build focus there are three things that you can you can do and they all start with s so the first is what we refer to as seva or selfless service. So once in a while, do something where you don't expect anything in return. Nothing monetary, not even a thank you, no emotional exchange. And that can be as simple as taking your sister out for dinner, paying for it and just walking away. Or going and maybe helping somebody who's in need and not expecting anything in return. Because when you start to do seva, you start to disengage from the ego, which is programmed to act based on results. That's how most of us act. We act based on results. We're driven by goals. And so we become attached to outcomes. And when the outcome is not in our favor, we suffer. And when we engage in some type of seva, it helps us to disengage from the ego. That's why I encourage people to come to the ashram. Spend a few days, spend a few weeks. We'll help you to, um, you do some construction or some cook some food or clean the toilets. We're not going to say thank you. We're not going to give you any money. But I promise you, it will help you to find more peace. Okay, so do a little bit of seva once a week. The second is sangha. Sangha is community. Build and be around a community that is looking to grow in love. Very important. And your community <laughs> Welcome, is exactly that. I love show up because, you know, it's not that everybody was into Vedic teachings, but everybody was there with the intention to change. Because you can't be there on a Saturday morning at six o'clock, not wanting something different than what everybody else is experiencing. So already there, there is this feeling of I'm looking for something more, some more purpose in my life. So that Sangha is there and that's important. And then thirdly is sadhana, a daily spiritual practice, something you can do for five, 10 minutes a day that keeps you centered. So if you can do some selfless service, if you can find the right community and you have a daily consistent practice, those three things will help you. And if people are struggling to define or f see clear what their dharma or their purpose would be, how would you advise people to, uh, to look at it differently? So when people come to my teacher or to myself and they say, you know what, um, do you think I should quit my job? The first thing I ask them is, do you love it? Do you love what you're doing? And they say, no, that's why I'm asking you if I should quit my job. <laughs> and I said, okay, fine, you can quit it as soon as you start to love it. This is paradoxical, right? You can quit your job as soon as you start to love it. And the reason for this is because life has put us in situations, not just randomly. You're in a situation to learn something about yourself. And if you are miserable, if the moment you quit it or run away from it, guess what's going to happen? In your next job, the same thing will come. Or the same situation will arise in a different environment where you will have to overcome it. Because that's how life works. Life will constantly keep putting things in your face that you don't like till you say, I am free from it. 
then it's done. Then you don't have to, then you don't have to look at it anymore. So for me, I say, learn to love it. And the moment you learn to love it, in that moment, if a situation arises for you to quit and do something else, do it. The moment you learn to love it, life will provide another opportunity where you can start to go into it. So I would recommend people love that which you hate and then everything will change for you. And the way that you can love that which you hate is by doing the three S's. Seva, Sadhana, and Sangha. I don't know if that's a hot take. It's yeah. the, it's <laughs> I mean, the it's biggest homework assignment I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But it's, uh, you know, they're very simple, very simple things. Very, very simple things. At the end of the day, and they don't take up a lot of time and it doesn't require you to be a monk or live in a temple or, you know, move into a cave in the Himalayas. They're things that are really simple that you can do exactly. um, every day that, that uh, can make a big difference. So. I think that's a pretty good point to to wrap things up with. We do have uh, we do have some questions from our Patreon members, though. Yes, yes, yes. We'll do that on a separate recording after this. Uh, I just wanted to to give you the spotlight if there's anything that you wanted to talk about the ashram, upcoming retreats that you've got going on, uh, your podcasts, eventual mm -hmm. other things. So, if people would like to possibly learn a mantra chanting practice to do a daily sadhana they can reach out to me on social media on instagram it's a swami chidananda or they can listen to the path of a swami podcast if they feel more inspired to go deeper and then in terms of retreats nothing's coming up but maybe we do something which show up <laughs> that would be, be nice that would be, be nice one thing you told me a couple of weeks ago was that if we wanted to go to the ashram, we could go. We should go soon because it's starting to be very yes, yes, uh, yes. busy. Yes, yes. So if those of you that might be in the United States or, or actually are visiting or want to come, our ashram is located in upstate New York. So if you just send me a message and say, I want to come for a few days or, or a week or a few weeks, then we can arrange it that you come and do some seva. And then you can spend some time there and get to to go deeper into your spiritual practices and take that uh, light, if you will, into the world. Because you see, there is a, um, a co-symbiotic relationship between the householder and the monk. And so in the olden days, what would happen is that the monks would live in the ashram and they would pray and they would teach. And the householders would live in the world and do their work and the householders would support the monks and the householders would come and stay with the monks to energize themselves so they can go back and do their dharma and so the responsibility of the monks is to foster a space where the householders can energize and the responsibility of the householders is to help sustain that place by providing some type of financial support so it's a very co-symbiotic relationship. So for those of you that are in the world that are working, it's not that you have to become a monk, but come and spend some time in an ashram and that will energize you. So when you go back to do your dharma, you'll do it in a much more clear and efficient way. Hmm. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Let's wrap it up there. Thank you so much for your time and also for today, you really treated us um, with your teachings and the chanting on the beach. It was a pleasure. And anytime you were in Barcelona or in Dublin or in any other city that we're at, you're more than welcome. Thank you so much. It was really lovely to be with the Sangha. It was, it was such a nice time. And, and thank you, Chase, for organizing all of this. Thank you for your seva, uh, for helping to organize the events. It was very nice. Welcome. <laughs> Bang. Done. That's a wrap. Mm -hmm.